So good afternoon, everybody. This is Neil Sutton. Um, I'll be the host of uh, the webinar Use of Force and Use of Force and False Perceptions. I'm here to introduce Ken Hogart. Ken will be our speaker for this afternoon. Uh, the webinar will run approximately 45 minutes, um, and we'll leave uh, 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Uh, so if you have a question, please feel free to type it in, but we'll save, uh, we'll save the questions for, uh, for the last 15 minutes of the session. So Ken Hogart is the president of Universal Training Solutions, which was founded in 2007. Uh, Ken has more than 22 years of business experience in, in technology sales, administration, and project management with extensive experience in special event security, utilizing crisis intervention, and strong tactical communication skills. Ken is, a license, is licensed as a security guard and private investigator in both Ontario and BC. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ken. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, I'd like to start off with just a, a kind of caveat statement here, a preface. Um, no one in the C-suites, vice presidents, directors, managers, or supervisors wants our guards to use force, definitely don't want them to use excessive force, or to have guards exercise poor judgment or make poor decisions, or anything to do in any way that may project a negative image of the company or service. In training, we are not encouraging or condoning the use of force. Uh, the focus in the training is on understanding the various aspects of the multiple factors associated with the possibility of using force. The value and goal of professional use of force training is to have guards make proper decisions, to have guards exercise good judgments, and for guards to understand the consequences and repercussions of the inappropriate use of force. With proper training, guards are less likely to overreact, resorting to macho or primal instincts. So we have the uh, presentation. I will go through that and uh, continue on. Many people hearing upon the term use of force immediately conclude that such training is violent, teaching police or security how to beat on people, which conjures up all kinds of false images from television shows, movies, news reports of excessive use of force. Nothing could be further from the truth. Defensive tactics sounds harsh. Uh, officer safety sounds like we only care about the officer. Tactical communication sounds like we're trying to find a way not to communicate. Tactical handcuffing sounds harsh as well. Uh, as a use of force instructor, I've heard a great deal of negativity towards such words, terms, or phrases. What kind of images do you think of when you think of use of force? Is this one of them? We're here, we have uh, an officer uh, learning how to control someone on the ground, and uh, it, it may not look good, but this is actually a very, uh, very effective uh, controlling technique. Or how about this one? There's a, that's myself in training, uh, holding down a person in a controlled fashion in, in order to facilitate the safe use of handcuffs. What other images do we conjure up? Anybody think of something like that? There's a lot more to use of force training. Uh, there's another image, and we're taking a look at the academic side of it, the theory aspect. What is it that we're going to learn in training? to help us, not just with the physical skills, but understand the decision-making processes that may take place with that. Just another classroom shot of doing training and, uh, and use of force. So there's much more learning on how to use force in the training. Uh, what we want to do is we want to uh, train them how to, to make decisions, a uh, professional approach providing use of force training is to encompass a variety of other elements uh, that provides uh, instruction. We want to make sure that the decision-making process and using good judgment is, uh, is the best way and that our objective is to find a solution. Tactical communications is a policing term. Um, you'll probably hear uh, conflict management. Um, we don't like to use the word conflict resolution. Uh, it's not realistic um, because not all conflicts can be resolved with just words. Uh, Police and insecurity, sometimes uh, words do fail uh, and there's no way to resolve the situation, you know, situation without a physical inter intervention of some sort. Um, for officer uh, safety, we may actually encourage disengagement, which is physical uh, removal of, the, of yourself. Um, 
if the conflict can't be resolved. However, we want to train and prepare our officers and guards on how to properly communicate with people in an overall goal of trying to find a solution. Attempting to try to find a solution using techniques or tactics to reduce or, reduce or alleviate anxiety. Uh, active listening, connecting with an upset person can greatly increase the odds for a peaceful solution. So we, we do a lot of training in the aspects of body language, active listening, empathy, and uh, trying to get that, uh, connect with that person to try to find a solution with, by whatever peaceful means necessary. This is a slide we utilize during training that uh, helps us uh, to understand a little bit about communications. Uh, we do have the, uh, I will be referencing the Ontario Use of Force model later on in this presentation, but this is a tactical communications model that we utilize quite often. Um, I, I, I say it's the reverse of snakes and ladders. Our objective here is to slide down, uh, not climb up. And so through the big red dots or the big uh, red um, stars there you can see, we're trying to take anxiety, any defensiveness or acting out and have them slide down to the lower right corner to uh, the tension reduction, uh, trying to alleviate anxiety and try to get the person to, to be in a more calmer state whereby we can hopefully find a solution. So this is another slide, sample slide, uh, that we like to utilize uh, during training, um, verbal response strategies. Uh, we really emphasize that the objective is to find a solution to any perceived situation uh, that we might be in, in involved with. Uh, keep in mind what is your objective. And I think one of the, the most common ones out there I like to use as an example for security guards uh, is trespassing. If you've got a call that somebody is trespassing, what's your objective? Well, 90% of the time, or the majority of the time, uh, your objective is to not have them trespass anymore. And if you can use effective communications to, to have that happen, then you're not having to deal with any physical intervention. It's another sample slide that we utilize, uh, a couple of strategies or techniques in the communication side of things. Uh, the first contact approach as a major component uh, with good communications, uh, first impressions. Uh, once again, the objective here is to alleviate anxiety by introducing yourself and the reason, you're in, uh, reason for the intervention. Um, you'll probably notice that the police, when they pull you over, they don't come up to the door or window anymore and say, you know why I pulled you over? Because that opens up the conversation to too many negative options. We want to tell people why we are having an interaction with them and, uh, and make that clear up front because people want to know why. Active listening is a very, uh, a very strong uh, portion of tactical communications as well, using empathetic body language and allowing people to, uh, to communicate and let them know that uh, you're hearing them and hearing what they have to say. A couple other stages that we like to utilize is called the ignore block and time verbal intervention. Um, you'll notice <clears throat> that the, the blocking the ignore and blocking may seem similar, but they're very different. Uh, there's a time to talk and there's a time to listen. Uh, we encourage our officers to ignore any personal attacks or insults. However, um, we want them to block any suggestion of inequitable treatment before it allows to get any momentum. Uh, we stop it before anyone can try to run with the idea there's you know, any suggestion of inequitable treatment. Uh, time verbal intervention, uh, try not to interrupt uh, try not to talk over or get louder, and uh, sometimes that's hard to do, uh, especially with many A-type personalities in this industry. Um, allowing somebody to vent a little bit and await the pauses and the, the appropriate breaks to intervene uh, can be very beneficial as well because people want to be heard. So here we go back to that slide again with the tactical communications model, which you can see from the far left, we're using uh, both the uh, anxiety slide and the defensive slide you can see the, the various techniques that we teach in order to try to reduce the tension, alleviate anxiety, and uh, in order to find a solution. This is situational awareness. Um, this is uh, pretty standardized in, uh, throughout uh, North America. Um, we talk about being aware of your surroundings, trying to avoid placing yourself in a bad situation, 
but when you're on duty and you're guarding whether it be property or people, you have to be alert. Uh, yellow is uh, uh, can be sustained for a long period of time, but you've got a going into orange and red, you can only do that for short periods of time. Situational awareness. We try to encourage our officers and guards to avoid placing themselves in a bad situation. Um, trying to be aware of their surroundings and what's going on. Uh, sample slide uh, here kind of shows that they don't get tunnel vision. Well, once a person's heart rate gets over 145 beats per second in a stressful situation, uh, they can lose up to 75% of their peripheral vision. And training people to understand that this could happen to them and be, be ready for that does help them uh, in minimizing the stressful situations and, and minimizing the peripheral vision. Uh, we also can have auditory exclusion at that point in time where they can't hear certain things or certain commands from uh, maybe their partner trying to communicate with them. Something we also have to be very aware of in the industry is pre-assault indicators. And uh, this prepares our officers and guards to be aware of their surroundings. Uh, look for a variety of indicators for violent behavior. Uh, we call them pre-assault indicators because they're, they're kind of a, an indicator or a clue, as we would say, that the, the person may be getting ready to assault you or someone else. Uh, whether the individual is showing these signs towards the officer or guard, a staff member, a member of the public, um, we want our protectors, being our guards and police, uh, to be aware of these clues and try to mitigate the risk of violence using other tactics if possible. Uh, this portion of the training allows officers and guards to be safer and better enables them to protect those around them, uh, be it a high-risk termination or a distraught member of the public. Um, I'm just going to uh, give an example here is, you know, Bill 168, we've got violence and harassment in the workplace, and uh, we've also got uh, a lot of people calling upon security to come in in any high-risk uh, terminations. Uh, those guards, are they being prepared? Are they looking for these types of clues? Um, I'm going to go through a couple more uh, pre-assault indicators with you as well. Scanning around the room, um, ours diving around, uh, smirking. Uh, when I get into the interior use of force model, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, where this fits as far as the assessment process uh, for, a, for a police officer or a guard to be uh, taking a look at. Another really important aspect of, of proper use of force training is understanding the legal authorities, uh, educating our guards and officers, not just on their, or their authority to effect an arrest, but the various levels of force that are acceptable, um, depending on the circumstances. Um, levels of force can depend on the circumstances, how the legal, si uh, legal system interpretates the use of force. The general perception is that police and security uh, are going to protect, uh, but are they ready if, if we need them? Um, public perception is also an important factor to consider here. We want them to know our legal authorities um, and the level of force depending on the Canadian law or system. This is uh, usually where I give a little jab about cops. Uh, this is not like cops or the TV or in the movies. Canadian's uh, legal system is, is very clear in the levels of force that are acceptable and uh, in our civilized society. Uh, training provides confidence, which reduces the egos and the possible overreactions based on primal instincts. Here are a few areas that we, uh, we focus on during uh, use of force training uh, to make sure that they understand uh, the various areas that they may be called upon depending on their, their job description. But understand the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms as it pertains to uh, search and seizure and detention, uh, all, of, all of those various aspects. Uh, the Criminal Code of Canada is very clear on uh, use of force and I've, I've noted the sections there in the slide. Um, but there's, uh, and, their, and their power of arrest uh, under 494 for uh, uh, civilians and security, but also 495 if I'm dealing with uh, special constables and police powers of arrest. Uh, Trespass to Property Act is probably one of the most common ones out there for security in the industry, uh, as well as the Liquor License Act, dealing with any licensed uh, venue, whether that be uh, a licensed venue uh, as far as a, a bar 
uh, or it could be a beer gardens during a special event or a festival. Uh, so understanding the Liquor License Act is, uh, is equally as important. It's also important to keep up with the current trends and changes in the legislations and laws. Uh, back on March uh, 11, 2013, uh, Bill C-26 came into effect. Uh, it was nicknamed the Lucky Moose Law. Uh, it was based on an uh, uh, incident that happened in the, the greater Toronto area. Um, I believe it was downtown Toronto. And uh, they decided it was time to make some changes with the citizen's powers of arrest as well as the uh, various sections of the criminal code where it talks about uh, self-defense and defense of property. So they actually took nine sections and uh, reduced them down to two and uh, codified it. Um, from a training perspective, it's much easier to, to teach. And I think from a learning perspective, it's much easier for uh, police and guards, uh, and guards in particular, to uh, comprehend the, uh, the areas where they have the authority to use force to protect themselves, protect others, or to protect property. I also like a little dose of reality, and that is that, yes, we are, have the authority to use force. However, you're excessive in the force that you use. You will be held accountable under Section 26 of the Criminal Code. Um, a little reality and fear is good to understand that, yeah, you, uh, you may be authorized to use force, but that force must be proportionate to the, uh, to the force you're being resisted. Talk about the powers of arrest. Uh, you can find those in the Criminal Code under Section 494, Trespass to Property Act, and the Liquor License Act gives you authority to remove someone from the property, um, and if it's more serious than that, you may revert to the Trespass to Property Act. As it pertains to use of force, there are several sections in the uh, Criminal Code that allow you to use reasonable force. Uh, to protect persons uh, administering and enforcing the law. So any police officer or security guard uh, using force while in the course of their duties, uh, that authority comes under Section 25. But they're excessive in that force, then they'll be held accountable under Section 26. And the various other sections there that I've listed, uh, 27 is, is like a Good Samaritan, uh, Good Samaritan law, uh, although we don't call it that. Um, and 34 and 35 are the revised sections under Bill C-26, which clearly states when we have the authority to use defense of persons for self-defense or protecting someone else. So when we're teaching uh, close protection or bodyguard, understanding that that's where you get your authority to use reasonable force, uh, or defense, uh, defense of property. So if you're a security guard defending property, that you have certain authorities there to use reasonable force to protect that property or anything on that property. We also like to bring up case law to make sure that everybody's current with uh, what's going on in the industry. Uh, this is a case law that, uh, as you read through it, you'll see that a, a judge made a, a very clear statement that uh, it would be reasonable to expect that you may need to use force uh, if someone uh, does not uh, uh, does, does not comply with your lawful demands, uh, that you may need to use physical force to uh, to affect that arrest. So now we get into defensive tactics training. Um, if your guards or police officers don't have appropriate training, what are they going to resort to? Uh, quite often, um, it could be violent, it could be ineffective, uh, it could be stimulated by primal instincts, uh, machoism, um, you know, aggressive masculine pride, uh, driven by ego. Uh, training and control techniques makes us all safer. And that's what we want to focus on is that uh, if you do come across a situation where you have to physically intervene, that you are using effective techniques that are conducive to, day, to today's society uh, and within the realm of the, uh, the various use of force models that are across Canada. We want to make it very clear that we're not, uh, we don't want our subjects getting hurt, but we also don't want our officers or guards being injured either. Um, that any self-defense or defensive tactics uh, are used to defend and control people. I kind of differentiate the difference between self-defense and defensive tactics. Uh, defensive uh, self-defense is more a guard being attacked or uh, or a staff or a patron, so they're using uh, 
forced to protect themselves, where defensive tactics is more uh, techniques that are being taught to affect an arrest or to protect property. So here we have the Ontario Use of Force model. There is uh, a couple of different uh, versions of this out there. Uh, you'll see uh, there's a National Use of Force model that is out there right now. Um, it's typically used by the, uh, the federal government uh, as it pertains to border services and uh, the, our federal police service being the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Uh, in Ontario, it's just uh, slightly different. Um, a couple of terms are different, but the concept is the same. Uh, you can no notice by the bottom uh, phrase there that we want to make sure that people are assessing the situation and using the most reasonable option relative to the circumstances uh, as perceived by the officer or guard at that point in time. Here's a sample slide from some of the training. We want to make sure that people understand that colorful wheel. It consists of two main components, the assessment process, allows us to assess the situation based on various factors, and we'll go through those in a little bit more detail, and how to make decisions uh, before we act. So the assessment process, we don't actually physically do anything. We are assessing the situation. The use of force options are actions based on what we decide to do based on our assessment of the situation. And this can, play, can change in a split second. So let me get into the assessment process a little bit more. We've got, it says threefold, uh, we've got the situation, subject's behavior, the officer or guard's perception, and what they had to consider based on the tactical situation that they're in. Uh, the, the assessment process is a key component to developing, developing judgmental skills and decision making. Uh, we try to figure out what's going on to determine the best course of action albeit verbal or physical. The situation involves the uh, assess, plan, and act um, component. Um, a continuous assessment uh, allows us to uh, understand what we may need to make a decision on in a split second. It also explains why different uh, use of force options may be used by officers at the same situation, because we're individuals. There's a human factor there. Uh, we may, may make different decisions. It's not necessarily right or wrong, just different. So as we go through the assessment process, there's, there's various elements here. Um, not limited to these, but these are a few that I like to utilize in training. Um, I use a little phrase, it was a cold and stormy night. There was four of them. One of them was wearing a tap-out shirt dealt with one of them before, they were right by the property line and one appeared to be carrying some sort of a weapon. That's just a, a quick synopsis of when you're approaching the situation, your observations of the, the, of the situation. Perception and tactical considerations interrelate to each other, so you'll find them in the same area of the model. Uh, they're both in the blue and we get that slide up again, I'll show you. Um, this, once again, talks about the human element and the human factors that we may have to uh, uh, consider in the situation. So how do you perceive the situation? What is your perception? How did you feel? Was the subject smiling or smirking at you? Uh, what was their body language, the tone of their voice? How did you, as a guard or a police officer, perceive that? And that's a very, very important factor. The next one is your tactical considerations. What happens if you disengage? What are the consequences? Is public safety at risk? Are you at risk? Um, what's your uniform like? Do you have any backup available to you? Um, geographical considerations, where are you in relation to property lines? Where are you in uh, relation to bus stops and various other uh, aspects? Uh, and very important, what is your agency's policy or guidelines? What are your standing orders? So when we're going through wanting to make sure that our guards are making good decisions and not, uh, not using excessive force or not using force unnecessarily, this is where they have that consideration because their agency policy or guidelines or standing uh, post orders, uh, this all falls into their considerations, their tactical considerations. 
use of force options, now that we've gone through the situation, the subject's behavior, how we perceived it, how we, uh, things we had to consider, now the outer part of the wheel allows us to lean out the available use of force options according to profile behavior. So, so far we haven't done anything yet. We just assessed the situation and now we're decide on what we're going to do, albeit verbal or physical. And once we come back to the, the use of force model again here, I'm going to attempt to, uh, to get a, a red pen here. So if we were to take a dotted line here, right across the top, everything inside that area, we've got the situation, we've got the subject's behavior, right? how we perceive the situation, and the various things that we had to consider from a tactical perspective, whether we're working alone, did we have communication, all of those things. We had to make sure that we understand the situation, subject's behavior, how we perceived all of that, and various things that we had to consider. What if we had to disengage? There are various reasons why we might disengage public safety, uh, making an arrest by a, a family, uh, with small toddlers, obviously, is not a good idea. Um, officer safety, are we prepared to do this? Environmental considerations, the uh, example I like to use is a big difference between doing a foot pursuit on a nice day in June like it is here in uh, the greater Toronto area in Ontario, or doing a foot pursuit in the middle of February in freezing rain or snow. Um, it's it's uh, environmental considerations, physical ability, and the last but not least, probably the most important, what is your mandate? What is your policy? What is your procedures? What is your standing orders based on the, uh, the client? Uh, if you are a client, uh, you've been hired to protect property during construction phase, what are your standing orders? So we need to understand that uh, the mandate or policy and procedures are also a factor, not just in our tactical considerations, but also are factors of disengagement. Everyone's favorite, note-taking and report writing. Um, we, we like to encourage and train in the professional articulation of language, uh, describing the situation and perception the officer has or had, and what was going through their minds as they were trying to make a split-second decision. Um, quite often, we do have the armchair quarterbacks on Monday morning that say, well, this, this should have been done this way, but keep in mind, a lot of these decisions are made in a split second. Professional yet plain language explanation is what, uh, of what has happened. Um, we uh, try to avoid, as that last point indicates, geek speak. It may sound impressive, but if the person you're trying to communicate this with, either verbally or, or, or through a report or to your superiors, if they don't understand what you're saying, um, then it's, it's not uh, not effective way to communicate. Handcuff training. Many people who aren't familiar with the proper training uh, have a false illusion that if they train their people on how to use handcuffs, they will be handcuffing everyone. Uh, this is simply not true. Uh, we train staff on when handcuffing is necessary for subject safety, officer safety, public safety, and to prevent escape. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, people are, are trained in the use of those as a, as a use of force um, option or continuation of force if they need to put mechanical restraints on but they also need to know when and when not to apply the handcuffs. We go through the various aspects of handcuffing to make sure they understand. Um, it's not just important to know how to put them on, but you need to maintain your equipment. You need to maintain uh, them in good working order, know the various names, the various parts, um, and keep them in good working order. Uh, nothing more frustrating than to have somebody arrive at training even with handcuffs that are rusty. Uh, we need to make sure that they're well lubricated, in good working order, just like any other tool that they may have, uh, whether it be police understanding their firearm, the baton, their OC spray, and their taser. Uh, in security, we need to understand possibly our baton as well as our, uh, our handcuffs and make sure that we understand that they're in good operation, how to make sure they're in good operation. If they're not, take them out of service and get a set that are. We also need to educate them on various trends. This looks like a normal survival bracelet, um, 
but uh, I'm going to take you to the next slide and take a look at the survival bracelet. What you notice here, and I'll get out the red pen. You'll notice that this part of the buckle, what does it look like? Well, as I slip to the next slide, you'll see it's removable handcuff key. So quite often we'll find that uh, protesters, uh, people like that, uh, this can jeopardize officer safety and safety of the public if you handcuff somebody and they have this around their wrist and access to be able to take the handcuffs off. One of the newest things on the market is this. Now that's a blown up version of it. Uh, it's recently surfaced and making everyone aware of these things is very important. Here's what it looks like, actual size, on the back of a belt, belt loop. So they can tuck it into the rear belt, rear belt loop, handcuff behind their back, have access to get the small key out, and there's where it fits into the handcuff. See how small this item is, how effective? Um, Protesters like to do this when they anticipate getting arrested and handcuffed. And here's a couple of the uh, advertising features of why you should purchase this product. So in summary, we want to make sure, make sure that our police and security are capable and competent in their duties. Uh, we hope that communication skills work, but what if they don't? Health and safety in the workplace, who is the protector uh, should someone become violent, uh, whether that be an employee, whether that be an irate uh, patron or customer that comes into the building. Um, concerts and festivals, intoxication is a huge factor. Uh, we all want to be safe and feel safe. We need to make sure that we're giving them everything that they need as far as the tools should become physical. Um, all kinds of different words out there and, and when uh, when uh, Mr. Sutton approached me about doing training uh, webinar on this, um, I think there's a lot of false perceptions out there with the, uh, the use of force training term that people perceive it as, as violent, but we need to prepare our, our people for the verbal engagement, but also the physical engagement should it come to that. Uh, not that we want to advocate that, but sometimes it does come to that. So there's all kinds of different terms that we we'll, can hear out there to try to make things sound softer. Um, physically enable them to intervene. Um, I've heard the term engagement capable, uh, physical intervention. Um, all kinds of different terms out there to make it sound better, but use of force training is the training in when and when not to use force, various aspects of communicating, tactical communications to try to alleviate anxiety, to find a solution, to try best of all to, uh, to communicate in order to get uh, a workable solution. Now this photo is not meant to uh, imply anything regarding the firearm, however, the caption is very, very relevant. If we don't train people on what to do, what are they going to resort to? Is it going to be primal? Is it going to be based on ego? Are they going to lose control emotionally and do something that is drastic? If we provide them with training, proper training, both communication and physical control skills, they're better and more apt to use those skills than reverting to something else. And it's always nice to end the slide uh, on a humorous note. This is a new reality that we're both in police and in the security industry. And we want to uh, make sure that uh, we understand that and we are preparing our people to be able to do the best they can given the new environment. Well, Neil, I'm a little ahead of schedule here. Is there uh, any questions that may have come up that we want to address? Well, thanks very much, Ken. I appreciate you uh, sharing that insight with us. Um, just to, as a reminder for the attendees, if you do have a question, uh, please feel free to type it into the window. Uh, in the meantime, I'll maybe get it rolling with the uh, first question. Um, 
Ken, if you could address one of the points you mentioned on one of the earlier slides about um, ignoring versus blocking and about when those might be appropriate uh, and how you would block effectively if you were confronted with a situation. Uh, very good question, Neil. The, the ignoring stage is usually used when somebody's, you know, personal attacks, um, telling them what they think about you, maybe making comments derogatory about you and your heritage or your family or anything like that. Uh, there's all kinds of things out there and uh, uh, usually during training we'll put things in there about a little bit of humor. You'll be called things like uh, a mall cop and rent a cop and uh, things like that. You just ignore those things. But if they suggest for any reason that you're treating them differently because of uh, something that might infringe upon the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, suggesting inequitable treatment based on sex, age, race, uh, religion, creed, anything like that, uh, I usually recommend putting your hand up like a stop sign and just saying, no, that is not the reason. The reason we are having this uh, conversation right now is because, and go back to the original reason why you're having that intervention with them. And it's very important to stop that uh, or to block it, as we say, because we don't want it to get any momentum or any bystanders to feel that there's any truth to that. You're there, you ignore the uh, personal attacks or comments like that, but when they're starting to suggest any kind of inequitable treatment, I usually recommend putting your hand up like a stop sign and blocking that. No, that is not the reason. The reason we're having this conversation is, and get back to the original reason why you're uh, having to chat with them. Perfect, thank you. Um, just to maybe as a follow-up, um, at what point would somebody in security feel that they've reached their limit uh, and may have to call in somebody else? At what point would you recognize that you're going to need some backup of some kind? I think during the assessment process with the uh, use of force model, whether it be the national use of force model or the interior use of force model, um, during the assessment of the situation, uh, you're taking a look at everything from the situation, the subject's behavior, how you perceive that behavior, um, and the things you have to consider is that maybe you are working alone and the only form of communication you have is a cell phone. And do you have that time to actually take out your phone and dial 911 or dial the control? Um, or if you have a two-way radio, do you have the ability to quickly call and uh, get back to dispatch or uh, command center? And, uh, and get some, some more bodies coming to help you. Okay, perfect. Um, you mentioned the uh, Ontario use of force model and the, and the national use of force model. Um, are there any key differences that people should be aware of? Um, yes. Um, in the, the, I'll just flip back to that slide. I apologize for any blurs you may get as I'm going through this quickly. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> so on the subject behavior, I'm turning up the pen again. So right here where it says serious bodily harm or death, in the national use of force model, we call that grievous, grievous bodily harm or death. They're using the language right out of the criminal code. And instead of lethal force here, they are using deadly force. So other than that, those two terms, uh, the model is very much identical. Uh, they may use slightly different colors. I think the National Use of Force model from the last time I was in British Columbia utilizing that. Um, it's more of a, a tan and orange um, color. And this is in the back of most duty books, depending on whether you buy it uh, for the national or provincial. Good question. Okay. Um, for people that might want to work in different provinces or are licensed in different provinces, uh, how portable would the, the training be uh, from province to province? That's, that's very difficult to answer at this point in time because the, uh, the guard licensing uh, and is controlled by a provincial ministry in every province. So currently in, uh, in Ontario, uh, the ministry uh, which brought into effect back in 2007 the new Private Security Investigation Services Act they brought that into effect and they slowly um, brought about training and there's a basic 40 hour course that you must have to be a security guard in the province and then challenge an exam and then apply for your license. Uh, they have yet to establish any curriculum or requirements for the use of force. What they do state is that um, 
the equipment, whether it be handcuffs or baton, must be issued by the employer and it must be trained on the usage of it, but they don't state what qualifies the training or what trainer could be qualified. So at this point in time, it it's not national. The training is not established nationally. Uh, as an example, British Columbia has a three-day training program, which is the AST or Advanced Security Training, and it incorporates both theory and practical on using force uh, handcuffing uh, in uh, in that province. And there are many other provinces that are following suit as well. Okay, we do have a, so a few questions from the attendees. Uh, the first question is, can you review what the requirements or steps are for a security guard to make sure are done or complete uh, prior to arresting someone for trespassing, uh, for example, warnings or written notices, etc.? cetera? Um, yes. Um, so let's use that example. Uh, there's a trespasser on premise. Um, the communication skills that we're encouraging guards to utilize would be to try to, A, get them not to trespass, uh, but if this is a repeat offender, so I, the, the question is somewhat ambiguous. I'm going to go with a few assumptions here. Um, that if the person has been requested to leave, and in the province of Ontario, the Trespass to Property Act states that they must leave immediately when directed to do so. And if they do not leave immediately, then they, they may, be, may be arrested. And that means that it's still a discretionary on the guard or police officer whether they're going to make the arrest or not. But if they fail to leave when directed to do so, through warnings, uh, verbal warnings, or written warnings, depending on the circumstances uh, in loss prevention, they will issue a written warning, or sorry, a written trespass notice to say, uh, you are not welcome here for a determined amount of time, and it could be three months, could be six months, could be 60 years, depending on how severe the crime was. So if someone has had a trespass notice, and they can give them that either verbally or physic, uh, verbally or written, um, and so the steps normally to take would be to, to ask the person to leave. Um, I usually like the three strikes and you're out, but that doesn't apply everywhere. That's just what I like to do. Okay, another question is, um, can you speak more about present case law and how you think this will affect the security officer's role? Uh, does it specify which case law or the Bill C-26? No, it's, it's, at the moment it's an open-ended question. Mm. <laughs> There's a lot of case law out there, um, and what we like to do is we like to utilize any current case law that's relevant to the security industry and make sure we incorporate that in the training. The uh, reason being is we want to make sure that uh, any new trends or anything out there like that, uh, we make sure we understand completely. Uh, as an example, um, investigative detention. Uh, in the province of Ontario, investigative detention is only permitted by sworn peace officers. Uh, however, in British Columbia, it is much more prevalent to do an investigative detention. But by case law and situations that happened here in Ontario, um, they do not. So it depends on the case law. Um, the, the writer of the question may be referring to Bill C-26 and the changes that came to citizens' powers of arrest whereas you can make the arrest at that time or short period time, reasonable time period afterwards when it's not feasible for a peace officer to make the arrest. There is no case law on that particular section yet and I don't think that any uh, corporation is running out there wanting to become case law because the courts have yet to determine what is a reasonable time frame and when it's not uh, feasible for a peace officer to make that arrest. Okay, here's another question. This is a, this is a good one. Um, do you believe that security guards are using force more frequently or less frequently in, um, today versus previous years? And what would your prediction be for use of force by security guards in the future? Wow, that is a good question. Um, I don't know if they use it more or less. Um, I believe that the intent of the Private Security Investigation Services Act in the province of Ontario brought in in 2007 um, the intention is good, and that is, is to provide training, both theory and uh, hopefully physical will come around, but right now that's uh, still yet to be determined. And I think that the more training we have, the less likely they are to actually use physical force because the training allows them the, the, the communication skills as well, so it's not just the physical intervention. 
And I'm sorry, Neil, the last part of that question again? Oh, the future. What does the future look like for um, use of force? I think that there will be less and less using of using force, um, but there will be probably a lot more clearly communicated uh, outward communication to try to get people to obey the lawful commands of whether it be a peace officer or security. Um, the YouTube videos, uh, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Um, there's a lot of YouTube videos out there and there are some people that are actually um, going around trying to entice security guards to use force while they videotape it to get their notoriety on YouTube uh, or various other video things out there. Um, what they don't start videotaping is always the verbal interaction prior to the physical engagement. It's no fun. Uh, all they want to see is the physical side of it and not the, the verbal interaction where the security guard may have been trying to ask that person to leave several occasions and, and and had some very good interaction with them to try to alleviate their anxiety and explain to them the situation and the reason they were there intervening. And uh, But none of that's too exciting, so they usually only start videotaping when the physical force is being used. Uh, my hope is there will be less force being used in the future. However, sometimes words fail, and uh, it's an unnecessary, uh, sometimes it's a necessary evil that we have to use force to, to effect an arrest, to protect ourselves, or to protect others. Another question. Um, what are your thoughts on having tiered licensing uh, for different levels of intervention for private security? I think that's a great idea. I believe that uh, the tiered licensing has been bounced around by the ministry and a few of the uh, experts that uh, we've been called upon. I think that tiered licensing is a great idea because we could have uh, several tiered licensing such as uh, the, the night watch person who watches monitors behind a desk their level of training is observe and report. We may have other people that have a license, and I don't want to uh, suggest what tier levels they would be, but let's just say uh, the next level being they have to physically engage with the, the public on a verbal basis, so they might be more of a concierge service uh, or maybe greeting people or maybe doing physical pat-downs at special events uh, where you've got the physical and verbal interaction with people. And then there may be a higher level of training, another tier, where we actually have uh, extensive use of force training on the various prescribed equipment, whether it be uh, handcuffing and baton, um, OC spray is, is or pepper spray is not uh, not in uh, Ontario yet for security guards. But I think that the tiered licensing is uh, is a very good idea. It's whether or not that uh, the powers to be can can establish what that criteria is going to be. And if they can facilitate the administration of such tiering and making sure that uh, you could still apply for a license and receive it in a timely fashion. Um, I had bounced around a, an article that I haven't submitted yet, but it was talking about the apprenticeship program. Uh, much, like it be, uh, much like it be private uh, or for a plumber or electrician or a mechanic um, that um, they have to use the... Uh, various apprenticeship programs, certain uh, hours, uh, certain training. Uh, I think that that would be something, although it wouldn't be identical to the other trades, but I think some sort of a security trade uh, where you have an apprenticeship program would be a, a very uh, beneficial way of looking at it or something for them to consider. Okay, this is a, a question about uh, training and equipment. Um, person asked about what uh, training or equipment a uh, guard should have in a hospital environment, but maybe we can open it up a bit and just talk about maybe a, a few different environments uh, just so everybody benefits from the question as to the type of training that you should have and the type of equipment that you should be carrying. The way that the, the ministry has set it up in Ontario and, uh, and, and the majority of other provinces as well is any equipment that you carry, you should be trained in the operation and usage of that and when it's appropriate to use it. So let's just use handcuffs as an example. You need to be trained not only how to operate them, but you also need to be trained when and when not to use them. Um, just because you have handcuffs doesn't mean you handcuff everybody. So I think that it's important to understand that first and foremost. Uh, training is, is key. As far as the environment that you're in, um, the, the hospital environment or healthcare environment, 
Uh, I believe that restraints are necessary. However, there's different criteria that they may be utilized. Uh, we're dealing with you know, possible patients. We're dealing with possible mental health issues. Uh, we're also dealing with um, you know, possibly relatives of patients. And so those are the types of environment that can get violent very quickly. And it may be necessary to use such, uh, such mechanical restraints. Whereas in the festival environment, um, or let's just use the hospitality environment where you're using, uh, you've got door staff, uh, handcuffing typically isn't an important thing to have. Maybe a couple of supervisors uh, if the police response time is slow after you remove somebody or they become violent. So it depends on the environment and the totality of the circumstances really whether that equipment would be required or not and the usage of that obviously training is so key. So we have another question along those lines about some of the future of use of force and equipment. Um, somebody has asked if uh, there will be more use of force options in the future such as TASER. I don't know. Um, I wish I had a crystal ball for that one. I believe that um, there are a couple of um, conductive energy weapons that are being considered. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to use any brand names out there. Taser is a brand name. But there's a, there's a handful of conductive energy weapons out there that do have uh, capabilities of, um, of recording, both audio and video, um, so that basically from the guard's perspective or, or viewpoint, uh, you'd be able to record audio and video of exactly what the situation was before you would deploy that conductive energy weapon. Um, OC spray, I'm not sure. There's just It really boils down to a lot of training and based on a lot of the current wages in the industry, I'm not sure that the average security guard is going to be able to afford training that they would be required for such things as conductive energy weapons or OC spray. Okay, this, um, this question is maybe a little outside the realm of use of force, but somebody has asked, uh, can you discuss the difference between an arrest for trespass and an arrest for, sorry, an, an arrest for assault by trespass? Yes, uh, the arrest by assault, uh, by assault trespass, uh, that was old section 41. Uh, and uh, section 41 has uh, been replaced with section 35. So when Bill C-26 came into effect on March 11, 2013, uh, Section 41 of the Criminal Code was ab abolished or taken out. It's removed. Um, and that was assault by trespass. Um, so therefore, that's not relevant anymore. So uh, the person who had issued that question, I do recommend you looking at Section 35 of the Criminal Code, where it allows you to use force to remove somebody from the property that you're protecting, and there's very various criteria in that section 35. Or if you're looking to effect an arrest under the provincial statute, whether Ontario or BC or any other province, is you have to look at the provincial legislation and what the criteria is there to make an arrest by trust for trespassing. So we have another question. Uh, again, not strictly on use of force, but uh, relevant. Uh, somebody was asking about. Um, uh, they're having a difficult time hiring guards for smaller events and one-time events. Um, do you have any suggestions as to where they could uh, find the personnel they're looking for? Uh, I believe uh, there's a lot of guards using Indeed. Uh, it's a kind of a, a job site uh, or a job job website. Um, uh, Kijiji is another one. Um, uh, I find that the uh, the next generation is utilizing a lot of online stuff, um, so that might be an opportunity if you're looking for uh, uh, some part-time casual uh, guards to be able to help with some special events, um, so that you may be able to utilize that. Okay, at this time I don't think there are any additional questions. Oh, wait, there's one more that just came in. How do you compare the typical use of force training compared to nonviolent crisis intervention training? Nonviolent crisis intervention training is um, it's training that is uh, kind of a how would it say this as generic, and it's it's very good quality training. It, uh, it it talks about how to try to resolve things 
with a nonviolent means, um, and it's it's a trademark. Um, conflict management, tactical communications, and you'll find the, the other term conflict resolution out there. Um, those are all very similar training, and the objective is to use communication skills to alleviate anxiety, try to find a solution without using physical intervention at all possible. So I think that the concepts are the same. It depends on whether you're getting a generic course that's kind of a brand name. Uh, I don't think it fits all solutions. I think that that's why a lot of my clients, I sit down and I do a needs assessment to find out what their jobs are uh, as far as uh, what they're wanting their staff to do and how we can uh, facilitate the training to make sure that it's meeting those needs. Okay, so we're closing in on the hour. Um, maybe, Ken, do you have any, any closing thoughts before we, uh, we end the webinar? Um, yes, I actually uh, was contacted last week by a prospective client and uh, wanted me to uh, meet with him. He had concerns with his uh, contract uh, company trainer. So he'd, uh, he did just uh, went through the RFP process. He acquired uh, or uh, selected a vendor for security services uh, for the contract. And uh, he, he wanted to meet with me. And I, I've worked with this individual in the past uh, with a couple of other uh, companies that he'd worked for. Um, his concern was is that the guards were receiving use of force training from a martial artist. And uh, I am a very proud martial artist of 36 years. Um, however, there's a big difference between martial arts and use of force. Um, martial arts, you're kind of a warrior mentality, and there are certain things in martial arts you should not do as a security person or a law enforcement person. Uh, you've got to win the fight and the court case, and that's the big difference. And his concern was is they were being taught by a martial artist, but they were doing no theory. There was no classroom. There was no reviewing of the law or communication skills. It was four hours of learning how to do the physical force. If they don't have the theory, I think that that is a big concern from a liability perspective. Um, quality use of force training costs money, but it also is giving you that peace of mind to mitigate and reduce any liability uh, or le uh, litigation that may come upon you or your staff. Um, from a C-suite uh, and VP and director level, uh, you know, getting the cheapest bidder uh, isn't always the, the best solution. Obviously, uh, quality use of force uh, training costs a little bit more money, uh, but what you're getting is you're getting all aspects of it, including the theory behind the use of force and communication skills and understanding the law, and that is really important. Uh, and also, I would double check and make sure that uh, the, whoever utilizing does carry some liability and errors and emissions insurance. If it comes to be a, a lawsuit, you want to make sure that your trainer is uh, going to be able to cover you. Excellent. So we're now at uh, one minute to three. So I'd like to thank Ken very much for his time. Uh, it's been very informative. And I'd like to thank all of the participants for uh, taking some time out of their busy schedules as well. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. And uh, with that, I think we'll close it off. Thank you very much, Neil.